Cigarettes, booze, and power all took over Madison Avenue in the 1960s. Suddenly, the men of New York's advertising industry had the power to sell products like never before. Through their creative work, the people who worked at these advertising companies, otherwise known as madmen, began to feel and be seen as self-anointed gods filled with power and prestige. What those men were taking part in was a creative revolution, changing how people would advertise in the world. But were these changes actually beneficial? Did the Mad Men era help society, or did it build the society consumed with products and image? This video will explain how the 1960s creative revolution changed advertising forever and how those changes could negatively affect American society. The creative revolution came about in the 1960s because of the success of the economy and the flourishing new media of communication. Television took the stage and gained a great deal of popularity leading to the creation of national advertising campaigns. In addition to learning to send their product's message across the United States, the television also began to compete and conflict with national magazines, forcing advertisers to begin to adapt to a world that constantly saw advertisements in their homes. This led to advertisers moving away from cartoons and caricatures to using real photos and creating realism in their work. Furthermore, instead of utilizing focus groups and surveys, the creative revolution moved towards the melding of advertisement with the creative instinct of Mad Men, ushering in a wave of new techniques which are still being used today. Some of the techniques include catchy slogans, seen in Alka-Seltzer's I Can't Believe I Ate The Whole Thing campaign, and the use of playful spokespeople for a product like the Pillsbury Dills Boy and Ronald McDonald. Advertisers began to put in their own creativity and humor into their work, as well as introducing irreverent campaigns. For example, Wells Rich Green's The Disadvantages campaign for Benson & Hedges 100s focused on a product gimmick, an extra long cigarette, and rather than emphasizing the extra puffs a smoker got, the campaign humorously explained the number of ways a long cigarette could get in the way. Also, executives at large corporations felt they had the means to invest in creativity and new ideas seen through their new techniques, but they also felt they had the chance to earn profits from rising markets. The newest market, which had never been tapped before, was the youth. Post-war baby boom generation came of age in the 1960s, with almost 50% of the population being under the age of 25 by the middle of the decade. Originally, the baby boomers were seen as an uncontrollable, anti-establishment counterculture, but they eventually were seen as an unexplored, lucrative market by advertisers. The youthful, adventurous spirit was channeled into famous campaigns by Batten, Barton, Durston, and Osborne in their Pepsi campaigns Think Young and the Pepsi Generation in an attempt to establish better relationships with this new audience. Reaching new markets like the counterculture and flourishing using new television ads is a testament to the creativity and the adaptability of the Mad Men in the 1960s, but their efforts may have negative effects years after their accounts were closed. 1960s ads ushered in a new age of materialism, elitism, and authoritarianism. As advertising in the world increases, people worry that man's longing for material possessions and physical comforts will dampen their core values. In addition, advertising gives people that mentality that the more items they own, then the superior they must be, feeding into the idea of social Darwinism and the survival of the fittest theory. From childhood, advertisers explain kids need the latest toy, and in adulthood, advertisers stress everyone should obtain the latest iPhone. Advertising pushes for owning more. In essence, the person who buys the most items is seen in society to be the most successful, which is why today people are consumed with celebrities and the extravagant lives of millionaires because the majority of people see them as the epitome of success, even though fame and fortune does not always lead to a fulfilling life. The largest danger of advertising, though, is that they have the potential to influence public opinion in their favor. Morris Holbrook, a Columbia Business School professor, explains that advertisement should mirror society's norms, but others believe madmen can mold society to their liking. For example, advertising gives unrealistic expectations when they explain products. Companies in the 1960s gave products a personality or image which made the consumer feel rewarded for using their product. Avis became the underdog, Volkswagen the minimalist, and Esso the tiger in your tank. Today, this kind of campaign is most easily seen in Amazon's We're the People with the Smile on the Box campaign, 
making the Amazon purchaser feel as if no matter what they get, they will be happy because they are purchasing from a company who always makes them happy. Ads also continuously establish the idea of roles of people, forcing people to feel as if they are different or odd if they do not match the societal norms. In the 1960s, although advertisers attempt to appeal to more demographics, they normally depicted young white families all participating in gender-specific roles of the family. In addition, consider the food industry. In cereal advertisements, for example, their advertisements give the impression that the sweeter the cereal, the better it is, making children prefer unhealthy food. Not only do advertisements push people to choose sugary food, but the U.S. National Library of Medicine posted research stating sugary foods have the addictive properties, yielding people who gain a level of addiction to the foods, creating an unhealthy population. Ad companies have the ability to convince society of products that can damage their health. Another example of 1960s madmen convincing people to hurt their bodies was through their cigarette commercials. Studies were being published describing the negative health effects of tobacco, so advertisers had actors in their commercials pretend to be doctors who explained that cigarettes were completely healthy. Pro-consumer legislation during this time did stop the blatant lying from commercials, but today, ads propose consumers ignore the health risks of drugs and alcohol in favor of focusing on relaxing and having fun. Advertisers can even convince the public to purchase products that are not superior. For example, Volkswagen's Lemon Campaign used the negatives of the Volkswagen Beetle as positives. They claimed since it was a weaker car, it required less maintenance and would depreciate less in value. Ad companies can implement their successful techniques to sell the public on anything or anyone. Although the Daisy ad was only implemented once, which depicted a girl being murdered by an atomic bomb, the ad is acclaimed for assisting the win of President Johnson over Barry Goldwater. Some people worry that elections will no longer be chosen by the legitimacy of the candidates, but by the budget of their political ad campaigns. And in the 1960s, ads are gaining a great deal of power, and modern ads have not forgotten those lessons. Furthermore, 1960s Madison Avenue was a period of change when boutique agencies transformed into massive corporations which then merged when public informed the basis of the major advertising conglomerates that exist today. The decade witnessed the growth of franchises and retail chains and concentrated ownership. By 1963, for example, regional chains such as A&P and Safeway controlled nearly half of all retail food sales. At McCann Erickson, Marion Harper masterminded the agency's financial growth in part through the acquisition of other agencies. Not only do agencies possess the potential to influence the public, but if only one advertising agency existed, then they could essentially convince the population of anything they wanted. In 2014, the advertising world was about to take a step that would create a new global superpower capable of huge influence. John D. Wren and Morris Levy celebrated the $35 billion merger between their two advertising companies, Omnicom Group and Publix Group. The transatlantic deal was the largest ever in the industry, uniting the world's second and third largest advertising groups to create a new global leader that would dethrone their arch rival, Martin Sorrell's WPP. Luckily, men behind advertising still could not get over their egos to build all-powerful empires. About nine months after their celebration, the merger was called off over irreconcilable differences between Mr. Wren and Mr. Levy regarding who would ultimately be in charge. The mentality of Mad Men still reigns, years after the rise of Madison Avenue's fame. The creative revolution changed advertising forever, but the Mad Men's changes negatively affect society by instilling materialism, elitism, and molding society to their will. But regardless of your viewpoint on advertising, one thing is for sure. The pull of modern advertisers will not let up anytime soon. So I suppose all we can do is sit back, do our best to fight how society suggests we should live, and maybe enjoy a Pepsi every once in a while. Have you noticed? You hear something new at fountains today. People who think young say, Pepsi please. Today agree. Those who think young say Pepsi, please. They pick the right one, the modern light one. Now it's Pepsi for those who think young. When you say Pepsi, please, you're putting yourself among people who like their leisure. With Pepsi, the drink that's young. So go ahead. 
you think you get the right one, the modern light one. Now it's Pepsi for those who think young. <laughs> 